So hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Eurotrip's big interview. It's fab to have you along because over on the podcast on the Eurotrip, we get the opportunity to talk to some brilliant people every single week, but there just isn't enough time to hear some of their brilliant stories. So we thought in this series, we'll bring you the interview in full. So you get an opportunity to listen to, as we've said there, some of their brilliant stories, but really just dive down into what it is to be part of the Eurovision circus. And this week, we are bringing you a guest that you may not have heard of before, but I think she may have competed at Eurovision more times than anybody else. This is backing singer Dia Norberg. That's right, Rob. Uh, that is probably a name that you watching at home do not recognise. And I can forgive you for that because I wouldn't have known the name beforehand either. We've spoken to some artists that you will have heard of in previous episodes here on the Eurotrip's big interview but Dia Norberg is a backing singer she has so much history at the Eurovision Song Contest and Melody Festival and like Rob says she's probably performed on the stage more times than everybody else so she has a bit of a unique insight in what it's like to perform at the contest. That's right, as you said there, she has an amazing back catalogue. She was a backing singer for Dami Im in 2016. In 2016, she was a backing singer for two countries, Azerbaijan that year as well, and also won Eurovision on her first attempt. She was a backing singer for Charlotte Nielsen in Jerusalem in 1999. I got the opportunity to do this interview with Dia while she was at her grandma's house. So I hope you enjoy that on this episode of the Eurotrip's Big Interview. And here it is. This is the Euro Trip. Dear, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, we will talk about your incredible career uh, shortly. But first, of course, you're in Sweden. There is no country that loves Eurovision as much as Sweden. As a Swede yourself, can you, can you explain what it is about your country and your country's people that means you love Eurovision so much? I just think it's this happening each spring and uh, we have four five six weeks of competitions that that are broadcasted so it becomes this like family event for every every, every saturday uh, from february march you know it's, it's it's a family thing and and um yeah i've been part of it more more or less since 99 so um it's been a big, big part of my life, actually, the, the Swedish Melody Festival and, and also the Eurovision Song Contest as well. When you're growing up, as you've said that, how, you know, how much of an event is Melody Festival? And is, is it really, you know, you sit around and, and watch every, every week? Oh, yeah. But when I grew up, it was only one week. And so it was only like 10 artists. And then it's, it grew and grew bigger and bigger. So now it's... Um, I don't think it's been as big as now, you know. Mm. Now, now, your first Melody Festival, and I think I'm right in, in saying, was 99. You're right, yes. And uh, I think we all know what happened with Sweden in 99. What a ridiculous thing that you managed to go to Eurovision with Charlotte and win on your first you know, on your first appearance at Eurovision. Surely you could have stopped then. I mean, obviously you didn't. We'll talk about that shortly. But what an amazing, amazing year for you that must have been. It was amazing. And Charlotte is one of my best and closest friends. We went to school together, to music school. So we went to, um, um, what do you call it? We call it gymnasium. It's like um, 16, 17, 18 years old. Well, uh, sixth form, I think we call it in the UK, or college, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we went to that new school together and then she brought me along on this journey and then <laughs> I got stuck. <laughs> it was so much fun. Yeah, it was, of course, of course, like a big shock for all of us. We were, is this really happening? Yeah, so great. Where Fantastic. were you? Where were you when you first heard Take Me to Your Heaven? Can you remember? Hmm. No, but I believe I, I lived in Stockholm at that time. I already moved there and um, started my freelancing career. So I bet I heard it in, in, in a small apartment in Stockholm. Yes. And then what was it like in Jerusalem that night? Can you remember the celebrations? Or maybe not remember the celebrations, actually. <laughs> it was amazing because as a backup singer, uh, at that time, we were, were very... Um, 
together with the artists all the time. We got the big flowers as well, and we were in front of the stage, and we, we really get, got to feel the, uh, I don't know, like the, the winning feeling. We, we were right there with her, and uh, lately, I mean, it's more the artist that's in focus, but I felt like we were a team and that was amazing. So I think we were just as happy as Charlotte, you know, like we won, <laughs> even though Charlotte was the artist, but we felt it too. What was it like for you coming back to Sweden after you'd won? Because of course, presumably the, the attention is on Charlotte, but you must have also, you know, even among family and friends, it must have been great for you coming back. Yeah, of course, it was so much fun. And Everyone is watching the Eurovision Song Contest, I, I believe, almost everyone, maybe not everyone, but it's a big thing to sit down and watch that, even though not everyone loves it, but it's, you know, it's patriotic and like, go Sweden, so of course that was amazing. We came back to, um, at the airport and there was flags everywhere, and yeah. So, I mean, you went to 99, you won, you could have stopped there, just tell us because I know you've been counting, how many times have you sung on the Eurovision stage? How many years? Uh, 11 years, but with 12 artists. So 2016, I was with Azerbaijan and Australia as well, with Dami In. <gasps> just crazy. We'll talk about 2016. Crazy, we'll talk about yeah. 2016 soon, because I just want to hear how stressful it, it was, because it must have been... <laughs> incredibly stressful but I'm right you jumped straight back into Eurovision and you were you were there in 2000 as well weren't you? I were with the Malta with the Claudette Pace because it was in Stockholm so they chose to have a Swedish backup line up there so yeah. How different was it being well representing a country that's not Sweden? Of course that... it's different yeah but you become this little group and you, you, you know, you hang out for two weeks and, and you get, you get, you get a close feel for, for the ones you're with, of course. So, but I mean, it's extra special if it's for your own country. Yeah. Of course. C can you just list us the years that you have done Eurovision? Have, I mean, is it possible? Have you got the list in front of you or is it all going to yeah, be off the top of I, your head? I did my homework. So I was like, I need to, because <laughs> uh, I, I can't really remember it in my head. But 99 with Charlotte Nilsson, Jerusalem. Uh, 2000 Malta, Stockholm. Uh, 2003 Fame with Give Me a Love in Riga. 2004 Lena Philipsson, It Hurts in Istanbul. Uh, 2005, Martin Stenmark with the Las Vegas in uh, Kiev. Uh, 2006, with Carola, uh, Invincible, in the Athens. Uh, 2008, uh, Charlotte Perelli, uh, with Hero, in Serbia. Uh, 2009, Maliana Amman, <clears throat> Lavois, in Moscow. Uh, 2013, Robin Schoenberg, with You, in Malmö. And 2014, Sanna Nilsson with Undo in Copenhagen. And then it was in Stockholm with Azerbaijan and uh, Australia. What yeah, an amazing... I mean... what an amazing <laughs> I, you must be a record holder. Surely no one has sang at Eurovision more than you. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I was actually counting, because I've been in the Swedish Melody Festival and, a lot, and, and uh, quite a lot the last couple of years as well, doing backups, you know, behind the stage um, or below the stage and um, so I've done over a, I, I was counting because someone asked me how many songs have you done backups for uh, through all these years and I was like I don't know so I started looking at YouTube and like is this me yeah that's me I recognize that that move or that that uh, that harmony so I, I came up to over 100 songs in the Swedish Melody Festival. I think it was 111 or something like that. What's the, I, I, this is a horrible question, what's, what's your favourite song that you've performed either at Eurovision or in Melody Festival? Oh. I know they're all different. Yeah, they're so different. Um, uh, I need to look at my... <laughs> 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 I mean, of course, it was magical with my friend, Charlotte, because I was so happy for her when she won. So it was like this 
drift really, but um, Carola was insane because the media was really big around her. So it was like this crazy circus around Carola. And uh, she is that type of person, like she creates this vibe, which is so much fun to be around. So I work with Carola still. Um, I really love to sing the Australian song, actually. Because wow. it was only two backup singers there. It was me and Anna Salian, uh, which was also doing the backups uh, in Jerusalem 99. So it was like her and me. So for us, it was a little bit like, do you remember last time we sang? It was like 99 in Eurovision. And then we did it with Dami Im, just the two of us. And it was really powerful. So. Uh and you both nearly won again <laughs> with Australia yeah, in 2016, so which is close. which is crazy. Uh, but before we talk about Australia, that year, of course, you were singing for both Azerbaijan and Australia. Yeah. How do you manage to sing for two different countries, especially because I think you you mentioned you were fortunate enough that they were drawn in different semi-finals, mm -hmm. but they were they both made it through to the final. How yeah. stressful does that make it for you? And, and how difficult is it to look after your voice as well? The voice is fine because, you know, when, when I've done a Swedish melody festival and as a house choir, do you call it like, a, yes. you know, yeah. you're almost on every song and you change clothes in one minute. Like, uh, so Eurovision is not a, at all as stressful but it's more of a team thing you know where should i sit should i sit with azerbaijan in the sofa and share with them or should i sit uh, with australia and she's almost winning we need to sit there maybe we need to go up on stage again and you know so it's more of a stressful feeling that you can't be really exclusive to one artist so that's uh, that's the bad part of doing more but I could do many more because you know it's a lot of waiting time in your vision so your voice can do many more yeah T talk to us about what it was like in the green room in 2016 when you thought surely for quite a long time mm -hmm. we could have won this mm -hmm. it was crazy I mean it was almost like she's gonna win this like we're gonna win this this is amazing um, and then we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but came so close. But I mean, that's life. But um, no, she was really professional and, and uh, just sweetheart all the way through. So, because a lot of, of the artists, of course, that you're working with will have never been to Eurovision before when they get to Eurovision, and you have been to Eurovision so many times, are you able to offer some advice and some support for them? I feel like I, I can do that. Uh, um, I hope that they feel, you know, a little bit of support and just like feeling safe that, oh, we're just going to go in that room first and we're going to try out the nears and that's going to be fine. And then we're going to do this and, and we're going to sit like this. And because it's quite similar, like these competitions and each year, you know that drill a little bit so i believe if i would have been an artist it would have felt nice to have someone who done it many times before so you can have someone who's saying it's gonna be all good it's, that's fine we're gonna do it so many times and like you know try uh, to bring some calmness to the whole circus uh, were there any times this is a horrible question were there any times when it almost wasn't all right <laughs> when you're at eurovision or i mean it always it always comes together in the end but mm -hmm. you know were there ever any occasions when it was it was close <laughs> you mean like something uh, when something goes wrong or yeah oh, something yeah, like that yeah, for sure i have two stories if we have time i have oh of course two, we do <laughs> Because when I did uh, the Eurovision in Moscow with Mal Malena Alman, La Voix, with those masks and very, um, like everything was, had to be really perfect with the angles and everything. It was this huge arena and I got the wrong pack for my in-ears. So I didn't hear a thing. I just heard like it was quiet 
and then you have the in-ears in, and then you have the microphone in your hand, and then you have this thing in your hand, so you can't really do anything. Uh, you can't take them out because you filmed all the time. Uh, and it was, I mean, it was one of the last rehearsals or something. I don't know, but it, it felt, you know, all the rehearsals are important because you have so few on stage. So I didn't get any sound. So I, uh, I didn't sing. I was just doing that, trying to focus, trying to look in the camera when I was supposed to, but I couldn't feel the beat because it was like this in this big arena. So I was just looking at my friends, okay, they're taking this turn now, and I just tried to feel it, but it was horrible. So when they were like, okay, thank you, Sweden, and we went off stage and everyone was like, that was great. <laughs> and I was like, that was terrible. I had an Italian woman laughing in my ears the whole time because you know it was switched yeah, yeah. so i can hear someone like blah, 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 <laughs> all the time when i tried to do the right moves which is not so off-putting at all obviously <laughs> it's that's the first time where you like when you're in the in uh, a backup singer but you almost want to like can we take this from the beginning <laughs> but you don't you know you just do but it was scary that was scary. And one time with Carola in um, Athens, uh, I got stuck with my heel in, uh, it was this uh, glass floor and each thing was like one meter. And then it was a little, uh, what do you call it? Like in between every- Like every a little grate or a little hole or yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, 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 it got stuck. In uh, the semifinals, you can actually see. <laughs> I'm gonna watch that back on YouTube I'm now. Like, I'm, yeah, it's funny. I'm like working so hard to just get my foot up, so I'm almost like uh, losing my shoe there. I got stuck, but I, I, you can't see it really well. But you can, if you look at me, you can see. Oh, there. That's the moment she got stuck. I think you can see that, actually. But, be, but if you were watching on the night, you wouldn't know because you were such a professional, presumably. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, in the finals, it was all good. But it was scary because you think you got, it's going to happen again. You know, and, so, and back then you had less rehearsals as well, I think, maybe, just about. So you would have had less chance yeah, to, to yeah, put it right. right. Yeah, and I was nervous because I was like, you want to look into the camera when you're supposed to, but at the same time, you need to check all the, the holes on stage. So, and we had those flags. So it's like the flag and then uh, the floor. So, so many things to think about. It's, it, that's the thing. It's all about the choreography as well, isn't it? It's not just about the singing, for, especially at Eurovision, because it's such a performance. Yeah, it's such a visual competition. Of course, you know, you, you listen as well, but you totally see everything that's going on. Yeah. Away from the, the stage itself, and I don't imagine you ever get much time for this, but is it possible to, as a tourist, talk about what your favourite place was that you went to during Eurovision? What was your favourite city? Yeah, because you have a lot of time off, so you, you get to explore, for sure. Uh, we had a great time in Jerusalem, and uh, they were very welcoming and the, the parties was amazing. Uh, they prepared so many crazy things for us there. So I think Jerusalem was, was mind blowing actually. Um, and then... <laughs> I can see you're looking at your list because it's so hard because <laughs> you've been to so many. <laughs> but I mean, being with it, when we did the, the backups for Sanna Nilsson, for example, it was, uh, we were, a group of uh, five people doing the backups and Sanna is also a friend and then all five of, of the others were like we're best buddies so we had such a good time in Copenhagen uh, and we also like took the train one day to get to this old house here for my friends to take one night here it was amazing that's no that's a great story oh no that's a fantastic story your uh your last appearance in eurovision i'm right in thinking was 2016 that's right isn't it with the yeah. with the uh with the, the double which is quite a way to go out um will yeah. you do will you ever do it again do you want to do it again 
I would love to. I mean, it never gets. Uh, I, it's it's always so different, and and uh, the songs are so different. So you you always feel like you have stuff to. It, it's always challenging, and uh, I mean, super exciting. And you get to know so many people in the Eurovision world, like the same. You you say hi to this one, and I got to know you know the Australian team and yeah so the teams are the same so every year you 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 know more and more and more people uh behind the stage and um uh, well i was close this year i did backups for doctor and he came <sighs> what an incredible song and we were also like this she's gonna win oh no <laughs> so it was so close i mean that was even one closer point. than 2016 one, one point. point yeah one point yeah uh yeah daughter will get there she'll get there though won't she i think so she'll get she there has... and then yeah. you'll be there with her <laughs> i would love to yeah i would love to uh, now think? we've spoken a lot about eurovision but that is only part of of your amazing career uh of course you've been part of rock set you've also done shows in las vegas as well now talk to me about las vegas because that is presumably a little bit like doing eurovision every single day <laughs> Kind of, yes, it's crazy, it's bananas, but but it also, um, I mean, that was my life for two and a half years, so you have your everyday things you do, you know, I planted my roses in the garden, and uh, <laughs> so I feel like I always have one foot in the city and one foot, you know, out of the city, and I actually, I did 10 shows a week, uh, two a night, and um, I had a, a great friend that was my roomie the whole time. And we, we had lots of fun, lots of good food, lots of amazing performers. I mean, I worked for Cirque du Soleil, so I, there were hundreds of amazing performers from all over the world who was like in this family together. So we did a lot of stuff together with them. So it was interesting in that way because it was not only being in vegas with americans it was like getting to know lots of cultures and uh, talents so i'm so grateful for that because now they don't really exist anymore as far as i know because of the covid and uh, so i'm so grateful that i i got to spend some years in, in that crazy company <laughs> <laughs> like, it's it, we heard it for 18 eight months before premiere is it impossible to compare it to, to anything because you really are especially with Cirque du Soleil is the best of the best isn't it and you, you you know you know that everyone there is is really at the top of their game mm -hmm. yeah yeah I can't really compare I mean I can compare it to the artists that has to to perform the three minutes you know in your vision like uh, now it's happening and now you have to uh, perform and now I have you have to be your best Otherwise, you get kicked out, <laughs> like a little bit like that. It was kind of, um, it was hardcore. It, you, you were never like calm. You were always having the, this little bit of a heart in because I was singing solo and uh, I was always a little bit like, I can't forget the lyrics now. Uh, everyone knows the lyrics of love me tender. Don't, don't, don't screw up, you know, like, so. Um, no, but it was, um, it was amazing for years. I, I toured with them as well in another show in Europe. So, yeah. Is, uh, great memories from there. Is Las Vegas as crazy as everyone says it is? I've, I've never been. I, just the city itself. Is it really crazy? <laughs> oh, yeah. It is. It was really crazy. I don't know how locked down it is right now. It's, it's kind of scary. It's all empty on pictures and everything, but it was crazy. And uh, it was so crazy that for seven months, I actually rented a part of a ranch out in the, the desert with horses and dogs and stuff. So sometimes after show, I went all the way like 40 minutes out in the dark in the desert and it was just nature beautiful so the nature around vegas is the most beautiful nature ever and 
national parks everywhere you can hike and you can um, just see amazing nature and in the city you can't like you try to take the back roads to get to your place because you don't want to go through tourists every day <laughs> through the casinos you actually you drive your car and you park it and you have your like i work here card so you go straight into an elevator just for people who work in the so you don't have to go through everyone <laughs> who's in short skirts and high heels you know like <laughs> so uh, oh. comfy clothes and just in and then home mostly yeah mostly <laughs> most of the time mostly. some crazy parties of course but but uh i was one of the oldest actually in my cast uh so some people they were like out partying all night every night and then they were doing crazy acrobatics the day after you know like russians and like they drink and they do crazy things like so but i was yeah i took yeah. care of my voice a little bit yeah. stuff that you couldn't do on a hangover <laughs> <laughs> crazy stuff oh that, now you were part of rock set as well such a, a legendary group that must have been, you know, for, for, for a girl from Sweden, that must have been just an incredible uh, part of your career. Oh, yeah, for sure it is. And it was just so amazing because I was in Las Vegas and I, they asked if I wanted to stay because I did my contract was for two and a half years. And then I was kind of done. And then they asked me if I wanted to stay longer. And I felt like, well, maybe I've, maybe this is like, yeah. I've done this now. So a good time, to, good time to finish. Yeah, so I was like, my contract is done and it was amazing. And maybe I should like, I don't know if I have any jobs left in Sweden or if I'm totally forgotten, you know. <laughs> but then like a week after I uh, decided that I would end my contract, um, their manager called me, Roxette's manager, Marie Dimbay called me and asked what I was doing this spring. And um, I was like, I'm coming home in January. And she was like, maybe you could be part of Roxette and go to Australia in February. I was like, sounds amazing. Yeah, so maybe I that did, sounds good. <laughs> yeah, so I did some, I had great male conversations with Pa Gessler and Marie. And uh, we got a great connection even before we met. And then we met in her house and we sang all the songs and I really studied everything. So I was super prepared. And they were like, you know these songs better than us. <laughs> 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 is it really two choruses there or is it one? I'm like, I think it's two. The one I listened to was two. <laughs> so it was really fun. Oh, amazing. I mean, I, I won't keep it for much, for much longer, but if we, uh, yeah, I was going to say, if we talk about what you're up to now, but presumably for you, like the rest of us, everything's a bit quiet at the moment. It is. So I'm trying to just um, take a kind of well-deserved break. Uh, and it actually feels kind of nice to just reflect on everything and uh, playing some piano and, you know, recording some small stuff uh, I record some stuff with my husband and his band and um, yeah it's it's quite nice actually trying to stay focused I'm trying to learn this music program logic a little bit <laughs> and that takes time yeah. all like programs it's like so many hours you have to sit with that so sometimes to, to, to just uh, do stuff like that and, and is that is fingers crossed when when you know when this is all over which is hopefully hopefully soon but obviously nobody knows have you got stuff in the pipeline what can you sort of tell us about what's coming up hopefully well i don't really know like i had some gigs that was set you know this summer so i guess maybe they will come later on uh sarah don finer we had some gigs with her and Lisa Nilsson, if you know, as well. And, uh, and a Swedish band uh, with my husband. We were uh, going on a tour this summer, but uh, that didn't happen. So I guess we don't really know what's going to happen. But I'm, I mean, I always hope for Melody Festival next year. <laughs> it's always <laughs> so much fun. 
Well, you were, you were one point off this year, so 2021's the year, right? Hopefully. <laughs> my, uh, my co-host wouldn't forgive me if I uh, forgot to ask you a question that we ask everybody uh, who we speak to on the Euro trip. And this is another really difficult question. Everyone asks what your favourite Eurovision song is. We're going to ask what your second favourite Eurovision song is. So it's the first and the second. So just your second. Just my second. Ah, I see, I see. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, then uh, let's say Euphoria with nice. Lorraine. I'm yeah, going to have to ask. I wasn't a part of it, but, but I love it. And she was great. I'm going have to have to ask you what your favourite is now. Now I've asked. Of course I have to say Charlotte Nilsson, Take Me to Heaven, because that was my first. And... and uh, uh, not so much for, for I mean, uh, I like uh, Lorien and Dotte, that's my kind of um, pop style, but I mean, it was just such a beautiful memory for me. So there it was, Dia Norberg, as Rob promised in her grandmother's house and that was a lovely setting uh, not forgetting of course all the fantastic stories she has had from a good 20 or 25 years or so in the music industry i said it at the start of the interview i would argue she's appeared on the eurovision stage more times than anyone else she's appeared on the Melfest stage too more than anybody else and who knows she might appear there yet again this year and speaking of Melody Festival, and don't forget that next Monday, the 1st of February, over on the Eurotrip podcast, we will be starting a brand new run of seven episodes of our brand new podcast, Melfest Monday, where we will be reviewing and previewing Melody Festival in 2021 with some help from some special guests as well. Yep, so you can get that wherever you get your podcasts. So stay tuned for that next Monday. First episode, the 1st of February. But for now, from this series of the Eurotrip's big interview, goodbye. <laughs>